hand and say thank you, thank you. Uh, so for so many Americans who cross the line and move past division, trust, mistrust, uh, to say I believe in the quality and the character of this man and I'm willing to vote him to the highest office of the land. Uh, I think the NAACP's history is American history, it's just not black history. And so it is a great opportunity for us to celebrate an American of African descent, not just an African American. Barack Obama represents the best that America has to offer. But as a race of people, African Americans, we cannot uh, believe that the, the election of one man to one office in a White House at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue have solved all the ills of the world. It cannot, it will not. I think the bar has been raised that each of us have an obligation and a responsibility to do more. We can't use uh, President Obama's election as a crutch nor as an excuse for what we can and cannot do. Because I fundamentally believe that we can't expect anybody to do anything for us that we're not prepared to do for ourselves. Here's what's interesting about groups like the NAACP. To a great degree, the advancement of the issues that the organizations fight for, for often a chip away at the foundation of what the organization was built on. So the idea that if historically the NAACP has been stalwart in the fight against racism, as racism chips away, if you don't find other avenues to look toward, then you don't have that same uh, firm footing, which is the argument that some have suggested, that the group has perhaps not changed enough with the times, has um, rested on its laurels, has uh, waved the flag of past victories, and has not caught up with today. Uh, how much of that criticism is valid? Uh, and what do you see uh, that needs to be done to move the organization um, into a, a better place, if you will, today? Well, if I'm honest, uh, a lot of what has been said is real. It's a reality that we struggle with uh, as uh, a national board. Um, there is so much work that the NAACP does across this country that no one ever hears about. Uh, when we have a problem with our executive leadership, our president and CEO, the world knows. But when we are actively fighting at the grassroots level in state houses and county uh, buildings across this country uh, to create opportunities for all Americans, uh, we're talking about school vouchers, about um, access to health care, that 47 million people in this country are uninsured, the uh, belief that we are, our public school systems are deteriorating, quality and affordable education is the hallmark of the NAACP's programming, the recidivism rate that is happening for men and women in our community. There's so much work that no one knows about. I would dare ask that those who are in the room would do a Google alert and put NAACP on your Blackberry and see how many times the NAACP comes up every day about things that they're doing. We're not ambulance chasers, but we are fighting for the little man, the little woman, and not just those who look like me, but for all Americans, because we truly believe in the American dream. Is it more difficult when the enemy is not as readily seen? For instance, in the 50s and 60s, Jim Crow and segregation was out front. It was easy to see that African Americans weren't allowed certain opportunities in this country. Um, when, when that lessens and it's harder to um, fetter out where the issues are, or it's more difficult to see if it's benign neglect, if it's racism, if it's just oversight, um, how, how much more difficult has it been with the, with the progression of African Americans in this country? I think it's more difficult because with uh, Barack Obama and the middle class uh, moving forward with African Americans, we've made significant strides uh, since the 1960s, uh, which some would say would be the end of the civil rights movement. But all of us have people in our family who are incarcerated at alarming rates, uh, who are unemployed and can't find jobs, who are falling uh, behind in classrooms. There's still so many people who find themselves at the bottom of life's well, not because they don't have a bootstrap mentality, but because the doors of opportunity have been closed to them. And I think what we need to do as an organization is to go back and redig the wells that we used to have in our communities. And we need to do more in terms of uh, self-valuation and self-determination as we move forward. And, and that's why we're so pleased that we were able to attract 
a 35-year-old to come to the organization. Traditionally, we had reached out to ministers and to political leaders, but we had an opportunity uh, to really dream big and make a bold move and entrust this century-old organization in the hands of a young man who we hope will move the organization forward. We're very transitional. And for those who don't know, we should note you're speaking of Ben Jealous. Ben Jealous. Who, about six months ago, took over Absolutely. as uh, president of the, right. uh, of the organization. The average age of the NAACP board is about 55 years old. But we should note that the NAACP has the largest group of young people, organized young people outside of the Protestant church, who are actively involved in activism across this country. And so what we need to do is harness all of this political optimism and hope and dreaming that President Obama started and then channel that in some way to like organizations like the Urban League and others uh, to really create a new movement, a second wave, a second call. For but us. in fairness, that 55 was an average. Average. And <laughs> skewed by a number of folks that are tipping that 55 this way. Well, Ed, I am one at 43 who yes. would dare to say to push the envelope. But I must say that if it were not for the 55, 65, and sometimes 70 year olds who keep the doors of the NAACP open because they remember when they had to go to the back of the bus and they had to drink from the colored water fountains. And I think those in my generation have not done enough to reach out our hands, to say, I'm ready to assume this leadership role. I'm positioning myself now to be in that place, um, to move this organization forward for another 100 years. Wouldn't it be wonderful in American society if we, there were no need for an NAACP or an Urban League? But until such time that America is really ready to look at itself and say, I am my brother and my sister's keeper, and I think the color of your skin does not matter to me, but what you bring to the table and the value proposition you have to offer, then I think uh, we, we're still in need of the NAACP. Well, that to, to a great degree was going to be my next question, because as we look out at this audience, most of them did not live through the civil rights movement. Some uh, did. Some, some did. But <laughs> most. Some did. I, right, sir? Yes. The letters, <laughs> the letters go here. Uh, but because of that, they did not uh, have uh, the, the sense of living that issue and problem every day. Uh, many of them uh, are uh, solidly middle class. Uh, those who are white may not have the same connection that whites in the 60s, particularly liberal whites, grew up with. So when you address a group like this, mm -hmm. who may not even, uh, outside of either seeing the Image Awards or hearing of the NAACP in school in one paragraph that they read, uh, know very little about the organization, know not what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. How do you make the organization relevant to them and how do you make them become what was a badge of honor? When I grew up, it seemed, it seemed as though every black person I knew was a lifetime member of the NAACP, uh, paid dues and the like. Uh, I'd venture to say that that is uh, not the case. So what do you tell folks who, who don't have that same attachment? It's an education process. Just like today you learned something new about the NAACP, that it was founded by a group of uh, white Americans, uh, Jewish Americans, and African Americans. Um, it's a leveling of the playing field. It is a conversation that I would have with Sherman or someone else, or even with Leonard, and say that relationships are primary. All else is derivative. If I'm able to have a conversation with you or with someone in this audience and share with you the struggles and the desires and the dreams that I have for my community, my family, and this country, I dare say that it wouldn't be far removed from the dreams that you would have for your family and for your country and for this organization. And I think we have to find more ways to have dialogue. Folks were in awe when President Obama won the Iowa primary. Lily White community. What resonated was his ability to communicate a vision, a resonating vision that people could buy into and that they could believe in. This country has made significant strides. We're almost there, but not yet. And I think that as we move towards a post-racial society, 